The Grand Miracle by C.S. Lewis, Part 2. Now I notice a very odd point. All other religions in the world, as far as I know them, are either nature religions or anti-nature religions. The nature religions are those old, simple, pagan sort that you know about. You actually got drunk at the Temple of Bacchus. You actually committed fornication in the Temple of Aphrodite. The more modern form of nature religion would be the religion started in a sense by Bergson, but he repented and died Christian, and carried on in a more popular form by Mr. Bernard Shaw. The anti-nature religions are those like Hinduism and Stoicism, where men say, I will starve my flesh, I care not whether I live or die. All natural things are to be set aside, the aim is nirvana, apathy, negative spirituality. The nature religions simply affirm my natural desires. The anti-natural religions simply contradict them. The nature religions simply give a new sanction to what I already thought about the universe in my moments of rude health and cheerful brutality. The anti-nature religions merely repeat what I always thought about it in my moods of lassitude or delicacy or compassion. But here is something quite different. Here is something telling me, well, what? Telling me that I must never, like the Stoics, say that death does not matter. Nothing is less Christian than that. Death which made life himself shed tears at the grave of Lazarus and shed tears of blood in Gethsemane. This is an appalling horror, a stinking indignity. You remember Thomas Brown's splendid remark, I am not so much afraid of death as ashamed of it, and yet somehow or other infinitely good. Christianity does not simply affirm or simply deny the horror of death. It tells me something quite new about it. Again, it does not, like Nietzsche, simply confirm my desire to be stronger or cleverer than other people. On the other hand, it does not allow me to say, O oh Lord, won't there be a day when everyone will be as good as everyone else? In the same way, about vicariousness, it will not in any way allow me to be an exploiter, to act as a parasite on other people. Yet it will not allow me any dream of living on my own. It will teach me to accept with glad humility the enormous sacrifice that others make for me, as well as make sacrifices for others. That is why I think the grand miracle is the missing chapter in this novel, the chapter on which the whole plot turns. That is why I believe that God really has dived down into the bottom of creation and has come up bringing the whole redeemed nature on his shoulder. And the miracles that have already happened are, of course, as scripture so often says, the first fruits of that cosmic summer which is presently coming on. Christ has risen, and so we shall rise. St. Peter for a few seconds walked on the water, and the day will come when there will be a remade universe, infinitely obedient to the will of glorified and obedient men, when we can do all things, when we shall be those gods that we are described as being in scripture. To be sure, it feels wintry enough still, but often in the very early spring, it feels like that. 2,000 years are only a day or two by this scale. A man really ought to say, the resurrection happened 2,000 years ago, in the same spirit in which he says, I saw a crocus yesterday, because we know what is coming behind the crocus. The spring comes slowly up this way. But the great thing is, the corner has been turned. There is, of course, this difference, that in the natural spring, the crocus cannot choose whether it will respond or not. We can. We have the power either of withstanding the spring and sinking back into the cosmic winter, or of going on into those high midsummer pomps in which our leader, the Son of Man, already dwells, and to which he is calling us. It remains with us to follow or not, to die in this winter, or to go on into that spring and that summer.
and the dead shall be 